Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. First contact is the initial meeting of two communities previously without contact with one another. First contact brought about culture shock and a clash of civilizations throughout the age of exploration on the North American continent. During a recent interview, I broached this complicated topic. Here are a few excerpts of my thoughts on the matter. I've chosen to present the eclectic history of North America in a series of detailed episodes during which I attempt to share with my audience in a positive manner the sweeping saga of the continent from its deep history origins to our present epoch. For the purposes of my podcast, I define North America to include the USA, Canada, and Mexico. I explore the interesting, compelling, inspiring, and tragic stories of these three great nations, their inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, and respective geographies. My goal is to search for the multiple causes that led to the thrilling story of North America, an action-packed tale that's still unfolding. I voyage back to earlier times and investigate incidents that set in motion a series of events that help explain the close relationship, but sometimes contentious relationship, of these three continental neighbors. The United States, Mexico, and Canada have many important features and attributes in common. It's not surprising, therefore, that the history of the exploration and subsequent settlement of these three countries are closely interrelated. The complete history of these three nations cannot be properly analyzed and understood without reference to the history of the other. In New France, my corner of the world, the French established an extensive colony in the New World from 1534 to 1763 exactly 100 years after Jacques Cartier first sailed up the mighty St. Lawrence River to Quebec City, formerly known as the Aboriginal village of Stadacona. And for all you folks out there who have never been up to Canada and visit Quebec City, it's something that you should put on your bucket list because it's one of the most beautiful cities in North America. And it's there, during the first years of the settlement, that we actually meet the village's or the settlement's founder and governor, Samuel de Champlain, one year before his death in 1635. I've seen the man represented in different movies and TV series as a younger man, but here we see him as an older gentleman. The key to understanding New France is the fur trade. The fur trade involved beavers, and beavers only lived in northern areas of North America where there was snow, where there was cold, and that's why their pelts were so sought after, because it was their protection against the weather and the cold, and thus those furs were in high demand in European markets. New France gives us a mature portrayal of Amerindians, something that we're used to today in modern films and TV series, Back in the days of old Hollywood, Indians, as they were then called, or as they then called Native North Americans, were usually depicted as superficial characters lacking in depth. Instead, shows Amerindians as the multidimensional individuals that they were. Most Algonquin Huron settlements lived by hunting and fishing, and Catholic Jesuit priests from France lived amongst them. The nations of the Iroquois Confederacy considered the Jesuits legitimate targets of their raids and warfare, as the missionaries were nominally allies of the Huron and French fur traders. Retaliating for French colonial attacks against the Iroquois was also a reason for their raids against the Huron and Jesuits. We cannot minimize the importance of religion in the 17th century. One should not underestimate the Christian need to evangelize to spread the word of God and share the good news of Jesus with all peoples of the earth in order to bring on the end time. Preaching to Amerindians was fraught with danger. The Iroquois did not take nicely to the Jesuit door-knocking and often mocked and mistreated these evangelists. The Canadian martyrs, and they're known as the Canadian martyrs, were eight Jesuit missionaries ritually tortured and killed during the warfare between the Iroquois, particularly the Mohawk people, and the Huron. These priests were subsequently venerated as martyrs by the Catholic Church and canonized by Pope Pius XI in 1930. Shrines have been erected, churches and schools dedicated, and municipalities named after the Canadian martyrs. When growing up in French Catholic Quebec, 
I was taught stories of the bravery exemplified by these holy men, with one in particular standing out, Father Jean de Brebeuf, who died a violent death in what is now southern Ontario in 1649. In 1940, he was proclaimed one of the patron saints of Canada by Pope Pius XII, and in 1984, Pope John Paul II prayed over Brebeuf's skull before joining in an outdoor ecumenical service on the grounds of the nearby Martyr's Shrine. The service mixed pre-Christian First Nation ritual with Catholic liturgy and was attended by an estimated 75,000 people. The Jesuit priests were not universally trusted. Many Amerindians considered them to be malevolent shamans who brought death and disease wherever they traveled. On the other hand, the Huron sorcerer or shaman is jealous of the priest's influence over the Algonquins and is as arrogant, adamant, and unflinching in his beliefs as the Jesuit priest. Both men use their faith, supposed secret knowledge, and spiritual connections as power to frighten, influence, and ultimately rule other humans. The huge difference between the two faiths is that only Christianity has an evangelical mission that has been a powerful catalyst through the common era for much good, bad, positive, and negative brought to the world. Native beliefs resemble Judaism, for example, which has no evangelical element. It seems to me that Jews, like Amerindians, are born into their faith and feel no need to convince others to convert and join their faith. I think that even if you have no religious faith whatsoever, or even if you despise the Jesuits, you would still find it an interesting story. It's a wonderful story of obsession and love, and it is a wonderful adventure of the spirit and of the body. What those people did going to a country where winters were far more severe than anything they had known in Europe, meeting people who were far more fierce than anyone they had ever encountered, having to deal with these people showing us something of humanity at its greatest. It's the equivalent of today's people getting into space shuttles and going off into space. It takes unbelievable courage to do this. As mentioned, the culture clash is dramatic and cannot be underestimated. An Algonquin asking another tribesman, Are these foreigners intelligent? The answer given was a terse and categorical no. To me, this scene was telling. A lot has been said about European negative evaluations and impressions of Native Americans, but the same can be said in reverse. In many ways, I'm sure Amerindians at the time felt morally superior to these foreigners, despite their technological advances. It was European advantages in technology, the unwitting transmission of diseases, and eventually sheer superiority in numbers that would overwhelm these Native societies. The natives quickly became dependent on European manufactured goods, products, and weapons. Initially, Europeans, especially the French, sought to trade, not conquer. But as the fur trade moved further west and slowly diminished in importance, land cultivation took hold. Europeans displaced the First Nations. As mentioned, native North Americans were technologically wanting, and this put them at a great disadvantage when faced with invaders that were at first technologically superior and later numerically superior. Native people were shown as living harmoniously and peacefully until the inevitable encroachment of the violent white army and settlers who were the harmful disruptive influence on Amerindian culture and landscape. These representations were far from the days of whitewashing in pre-60s traditional depictions of native peoples, where white actors in the old John Wayne movies were cast for roles not meant for them. When instead of hiring someone that fit the intended race or ethnicity of a character, a white person was traditionally given that role. Old Hollywood whitewashing had a two-pronged effect, for not only did it impede Native American representation in film, but it also forced them into stereotypical roles. Some believe, however, that the pendulum has swung from one extreme to the other and that nowadays a simplistic one-dimensional depiction of both cultures has returned to the big screen, but in a totally opposite way or reverse manner. Some feel Amerindians are now often depicted as flawless and virtuous victims, while Euro-Americans are portrayed as cardboard villains. I believe that both extremes of the spectrum, gamut or pendulum, are simplistic, immature, unsophisticated, false, childish, and ultimately boring. Two wrongs don't make a right.
I found that the truth usually lies in the middle. All human history is awash in gray. Simple-minded, bipolar interpretations and presentations are a waste of time. All peoples and cultures should be portrayed in the arts as they appear in the real world. Multifaceted, complex beings. In other words, the good, the bad, the positive, the negative, the culture, the cruelty, the beauty, the brutality, the sophistication, and the savagery. The Huron tribes were scattered throughout Quebec, Ontario, and into the Great Lakes region. The priest wanting or being sent by the powers that be in his religious order to the limits of the Huron nation. That whole voyage, it shows the distances and also the willingness of this religious order and of these priests and these individuals to go about their work, which is quite fascinating to our modern senses. But I have to come back once again to the culture shock on both sides, which we should never underestimate. For example, the natives cannot understand why French priests refrain from relations with women. They view this as strange and even demonic. On the other hand, the uninhibited, free and natural love practiced by the natives is viewed as strange, primitive and sinful by the priests. Once again, the cultural gaps and misunderstandings were enormous. History irrefutably teaches us that all human beings have the potential of being evil, and when given the power and opportunity they are. The universal principle of force and might make right applies to all people, cultures, nations, and continents throughout world history, including North America's pre-Columbian societies. This shows us humanity at all its best and worst. Amerindian way of life was not inferior or superior, it was just different. In certain areas, among certain tribes, warfare and feuding were endemic. Also, aboriginal arrival and presence on the continent had serious environmental consequences. For example, some believe Paleo-Americans hunted certain megafauna to extinction. I invite the audience to check out episodes 3 to 11 of my podcast for more on all of this. Also, in the great unwitting exchange of bacteria, viruses, and infectious diseases that transpired between the peoples of two worlds, Unfortunately for the North American indigenous peoples, it was they who got the shorter end of the stick and thus inadvertently suffered most. In the 16th century, Eurasian diseases such as smallpox and measles, which were endemic among the colonists but new to North America, caused the deaths of 90% of the indigenous people, resulting in great losses to their societies and cultures. Europeans thus unknowingly unleashed a form of bacterial epidemic to which Aboriginal peoples had no immunity that ravaged the original inhabitants of the continent. After European contact, Amerindians suffered high fatalities of Eurasian diseases. Studies have shown that the diseases were likely carried by the increased number of immigrants where smallpox was prevalent. There were several tribes that inhabited northeastern North America. There were the Algonquin, part of the Huron Nation, the Montagnais, and then the Iroquois, the Mohawks. The Montagnais at first are depicted as having never actually met Europeans, so that was a moment of first contact which occurred between those people and them actually seeing Europeans for the first time, and they make some comments about their bearded faces saying that they looked like dogs. With regards to the Iroquois, they are not depicted in a good light at all points, and there were some critics who objected to that. Well, at the time, the Iroquois Confederacy and the Huron Nations were enemies. One of the reasons why they were enemies during the early colonization of the continent by Europeans was the fur trade. And who would control the fur trade? Who would supply the Europeans with the furs and control of the corresponding territories? With regards to the French living in New France and the fur trade, the Hurons were allies of the French, and the Iroquois thus saw the French as being enemies and saw these Jesuit priests who seemed to be only bringing disease and mayhem wherever they went as the enemy, and that's why they were very belligerent towards them. The Amerindians of northeastern North America did live in sophisticated societies, and actually some of their government structure was used as a model later on, even in the founding of the United States. So a lot of light has been shed on this in the past few decades, which is something that is to be appreciated not only by historians, but fans of the historiosity, and also bringing to light the positive side of Amerindians to 
what has not always been a kind approach when it comes to the historiosity of their culture. During the pre-Columbian years, there wasn't a lot of direct trade because of the distance, but there was indirect trade in that items that had been traded in approximate way had trickled down to both cultures. So we find often Mesoamerican items, art and artifacts that are found up in northern North America because they were traded basically from one tribe to the next, from one nation to the next, from one area to the next, and moved their way all the way up to the northern part of the continent. One thing that we must always remember is that looking back in history, we have to try and understand understand what these folks were living through. And one of the things that they experienced was overcoming distance. And as mentioned, 1,500 miles in today's terms can be easily overcome. But back then, it was an adventure of a lifetime when most folks didn't even leave the periphery of their villages. Traveling from Europe to the Americas at the time of colonization was like flying to the moon. I don't think that's overestimated. It's a grand journey. The distances are huge. And those who embark on those journeys and want to meet all the challenges going along, those are a special breed of people. That's why Europeans were so dependent on Amerindians during the first decades and even the first century upon their arrival because they needed Amerindians to survive. Amerindians were used to living in those areas. They had adapted over centuries and even millennia, and they were able to help the Europeans to also adapt and even, in some cases, survive. In the Hurons' village, there is total panic and despair because of diseases. Not understanding the transmission of viruses back then, the people were very wary of the Jesuit priests, the new arrivals, the, the foreigners, who they thought had brought these diseases in some demonic form. It's obviously not the paradise that the young priest was hoping to arrive at. Instead, it is his job to try and find some way of living alongside these people because although he's a new arrival, he's the only one left when the older priest that greeted him died shortly thereafter. The priest actually baptizing the Amerindians and giving them hope that this baptism will free them from this terrible plague, the plague that is killing their villagers. You also get the impression that Amerindians, the Hurons, were not very sincere in their conversion. They were basically willing to do anything to get rid of this pestilence and therefore accepted to be baptized and to be, in a way, I guess, traitors to their own culture, but as a means of survival. In other words, we've got nothing to lose at this point. He wants to baptize us. He says that it'll save us. So be it. But the final text gives us the results in that 15 years later, most of the Hurons in that village had died of the pestilence, and the Jesuit priests basically abandoned those missions and went back to Quebec City, and many of them back to France. It was a nuanced and sophisticated and mature look at how the Jesuit priests were trying to do good. Now, we can look back hundreds of years later and say, how dare they have done that? But at the time, they thought they were doing good. They sincerely, in good faith, thought that they were bringing good news to the Amerindians, who were ignorant at the time of Jesus Christ. They were not aware of Christianity, and therefore it was their job and part of their evangelization to get out there, overcome the obstacles, and hopefully convert and baptize these people so that they could one day reach paradise. Because that's their ultimate goal. They think they're doing good, and what they're doing will lead to paradise. And also convinced that if the Amerindians accept their message and are converted and baptized, that they too will find paradise. So this is heavy stuff for those folks back then. We can't underestimate that, looking at it from a contemporary or modern viewpoint. This was very serious and important to them. In the same way that the Amerindians, we see how their religion is important to them and how they are convinced that their beliefs will bring them happiness after death. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, we cannot underestimate the culture clash and we cannot underestimate the difference in religions and how fervently each group believed in their religion. 
Canada has different groups of native peoples who are considered Métis, which is an Aboriginal word for a mixture of two cultures, a mixture of the French culture and a mixture of the Amerindian culture. So there was a lot of interaction between both cultures up here in Canada. As there was also elsewhere throughout North America, and the same case can be made for Mesoamerica with regards to the Spanish. So human beings, in whatever place they find themselves, or in whatever civilization or society or culture they find themselves, it all boils down to very basic values. And when you study history for long enough, you realize that all the superficial things that sometimes we focus too much on be it language, color of skin, sex, female, male, culture, regional differences. When you boil all that down, it's a cliche to say we all have so much in common, but I think it's very true. History is complicated. There are accolades for some and blame for others. Too often, present-day historical scholarship focuses on a tale of woe and oppression regarding Western civilization. They ignore the many accomplishments to instead dwell on the negative, the faults, and the shortcomings. A new, fair, delicate balance is needed in our historical analysis. By the way, an interesting topic to research, study, and present, and I'm speaking to the young folks out there, the young budding historians, is the history of history. And what I mean by this is the study of how historians have interpreted and presented the past over time. The 19th century view of Amerindians is regarded now as being much different than ours today. For example, how have native peoples been seen through the historical lens in different eras? What about the evolution of the word savage? The actual word savage, or sauvage in French, has evolved over the centuries and has been used differently, different connotations. The pendulum of historical interpretation too often swings from one extreme to the other. This indelible fact should be brought to light. In the end, I find that if you're working, studying, and interpreting in the middle zone, that's where you'll often find the truth. Everything about my projects and activities can be found at markvinet.com. That's M-A-R-K-V-I-N-E-T dot com. There you will find info regarding my History of North America podcast and videocast series, along with details regarding the many books I have authored, including Da Vinci Code Meets Mission Impossible International Historical Mystery and Suspense Thrillers, available in print and digital format on Amazon. It's been a real pleasure. And I hope we get to do it again soon. I hope you enjoyed these interview excerpts. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.